uh, we can start our seminar. Uh, dear friends and today's uh, honored guests, uh, guest speakers, Dr. C. D. Mai sir and Dr. Anand Kumar sir. It gives me immense pleasure in welcoming all of you for this informative series of seminars on cutting edge technologies. The series of 12 months, 12 seminars has been planned during 2021 by Emerging Technology Special Purpose Group of Alumni of Jnana Prabodhini Prashala. So after the artificial intelligence, data science and blockchain technology, we are now going to discuss about agricultural technologies and the topic for today's seminar is the future of GM and GE crops in India, genetically modified and gene edited crops in India. We have two eminent scientists, uh, scientist speakers for this seminar, Dr. C.D. Mai, who is president of South Asia Biotechnology Center, New Delhi, and Dr. P. Anand Kumar, who is scientist emeritus, Indian Institute of Rice Research, Hyderabad. I will briefly introduce both the speakers and then request, request them to give their presentations. And after both the presentations are over, then we will take up the question answers. So if you have any questions, you can put it in chat box so that you don't miss out on any of the things. And at the end of the, after the two presentations are completed, then we can have a, a discussion on the questions. So Dr. C.D. Mai is a renowned cotton scientist and is currently serving as president of South Asia Biotechnology Center. New Delhi and chairman of AFC India Limited, formerly Agricultural Finance Corporation of India, Mumbai. He was born in farming family of Maharashtra. If I recollect it correctly, I think it was in Buldhana district. Yeah, yeah. And Dr. C.D. Bai obtained his agricultural degree from Maharashtra and PhD from IRI in plant pathology. He commenced his career in plant pathology research at IRI and worked at various capacities at Central Rice Research Institute, Katak, Punjab Agricultural University, Ludhiana, Ford Foundation, Delhi, Maharashtra Agricultural University, Par Maratwada Agricultural University, Parbadi, for nearly 30 years. The research, teaching, and extension experience led him to work as Vice Chancellor of MAU, Parbadi, and subsequently Director, Central Institute of Cotton Research, Nagpur and Agricultural Commissioner, Government of India, New Delhi, before retiring as Chairman of Agricultural Scientist Recruitment Board, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare of uh, Government of India. Uh, through specialized in, though specialized in plant pathology, Dr. Mai uh, committed himself for the growth of Indian agriculture. He has guided 20 PhDs and more than 38 MSc students, wrote books and monograph, published over 200 scientific publications in journals of repute and served the cause through development of the subject. He was elected as fellow member of several scientists, scientific committees and associations, including vice president of National Academy of Agricultural Sciences and also invited as member of international societies, including ESA and ABNE Africa. During his scientific career, Dr. Mai promoted the production technologies of cotton, groundnut, sunflower, and coarse cereals. Cotton biotechnology is his passion, and he was associated with the first commercial release of BT cotton in India from time of conduct of biosafety and bioefficiency trials, evaluations, till release by Genetic Engineering Approval Committee. He developed biotech infrastructure in Nagpur and Parbani, and has organized the International Cotton Genomic Initiative Conference and Fifth World Cotton Research Congress in Mumbai. Dr. Mai has been Alexander Humboldt Fellow of Germany. He is recipient of several awards for agricultural development. Recently, he was honored by giving Lifetime Achievement Award by, of FIKI at the hands of Ministry of Chemicals and uh, Chemicals on 17th of March. So. We really are very fortunate to have you, sir, for today's webinar. Because thank you very much. Dana Prabodhini has a lot of people who are holding very uh, important positions, and they have succeeded in various professional parts of their career. And it will be a great to uh, listen to you about this very important topic. 
now I come to introduction of Dr. Anand Kumar, who is scientist emeritus, uh, Indian Institute of Rice Research, Hyderabad. Dr. Kumar is scient scientist emeritus in I IRRR, IIRR, Hyderabad. Earlier, he served as director, National Institute of Plant Biotechnology, New Delhi, and director, Institute of Biotechnology, Andhra Pradesh Agricultural University, Hyderabad. He okay. obtained a B.Sc. degree in botany from Sri Venkateshwara University, Tirupati. He joined as scientist of agricultural research service of Indian Council of Agriculture Research in 1978. He obtained Ph.D. degree in plant physiology from IRI, New Delhi. After working as Alexander von Humboldt Fellow of in the University of Hanover, he moved to Biotechnology Center IRI in 1993. He specialized in the area of transgenic development for insect resistance, utilizing the genes encoding insecticidal protein Bacillus thuringiensis. Dr. Kumar developed fruit borer resistant brinjal and tomato pod and tomato, pod borer resistant pigeon pea and herbicide tolerant rice, which were licensed to private companies. In association with uh, Assam Agricultural University Zorhat. He also developed pod borer resistant chickpea. Dr. Kumar published over 200 research articles, books, and book chapters. He obtained three patents on codon modified and chimeric Bt genes. His current research interest is functional genomics of aerobic rice. Recently, he developed a protocol for regeneration of in vitro of a single cell C4 plant. Dr. Kumar served as Secretary of Society for Plant Biochemistry and Biotechnology in India. And he is also an editor of GM Crops and Food. He has a lot of honors and awards received, which include Sardar Patel Best ICR Institute Award, uh, Mahindra Krishi Samriddhi Award, Recognition Award, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, National Bioscience Award, De Department of Biotechnology, Fellow National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, Fellow National Academy of Sciences, Fellow Alexander von Humboldt, Germany, Fellow AP Academy of Sciences, Young Scientist Award, Professor Hiraral Chakravarti Award of Indian Science Congress Association, Doda Raghavaredi Medal for Plant Protection Association of India. So we really are grateful to you, sir, for taking out your time and spending this Sunday evening with us. And it is really going to be a very exciting session. I don't want to waste any further time. So I would now hand over to Dr. Mai. I would request all of you to keep your mics on mute mode. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Dr. Mai, please. Yeah, thank yeah. you, sir. I think uh, everybody is able to see my slides. Yes, sir. We are able to see yeah. your slide. Yeah. I will make it a full screen now. Thank you very much for inviting me for this Dana Prabodhini. I think Dravid Sab has uh, allowed me or rather given me an opportunity to meet some of my very old friends like Anand Kumar, Prakash and so many others who have already attended this session. I am, uh, I will be, uh, although you have a very long introduction at the old age of 75, our back introduction has no meaning now, actually. <laughs> but anyway, you are, we are thankful to you for introducing me to the people. Uh, friends, uh, uh, I would be just taking about half an hour or 35 minutes to show you how that four innovations really brought about the change in agriculture in the 20th century in India. Now, for example, the very first is mechanization. You see now, totally, we are also going in cotton. We are thinking to have cotton pickers as one of our top priority research in cotton. Fertilizer innovation of 1913 by Heber, I think, has synthesized ammonia, transformed agriculture productivity. Pesticides, another very important, and genetics. Let me tell you, in 60s, dwarf weeds rapidly replaced the Asia subcontinent hunger surplus. And that is what we call it as the green revolution period. The developed world basically became more complacent. And now we are in the innovation which will change agriculture in the next century. I must owe 
for green revolution to great persons of indian scientist dr swaminathan who was our teacher and also dr norman borla who led the entire situation of green revolution and you can see i was just trying to show you how that progress has been but let me tell you that biotechnology is nothing new that we are not in a continuum agricultural technology is a continuum from green revolution from wheat in wheat rst gene in rice genes we have come to hybridization in sorghum in castor in vegetables in maize in millets in the dryland agriculture it was a part revolution it may not be totally green but it used to be around green then comes biotechnology with lot of traits in soybean cotton and everything now it is new breeding technologies and then the geo drying technologies will come in future so you will find that this particular continuum from traditional farming to conversion uh, convergence i think is a very long and very big way we are experienced lots of revolutions in the past food revolution fruit revolution fresh revolution egg revolution and milk revolution white i think these are all the results of what we our scientific community has done to indian agriculture today you will find that the agriculture gdp horticulture contributes 37% more you will be surprised that the total horticulture production has surpassed the food production 337 million tons while we are also almost now through more than 310 million tons of food production dairy huge amount of dairy production and we have developed that robust production system in the country but what is now genetic engineering the major innovation that is biotechnology why do we needed the solution we found that there are certain problems like viral disease now you know corona the moment we talk about corona today it is a pandemic 2020 has been a pandemic year for and 21 also we are experiencing now we are worried and that's why we have a technology called as vaccination i think i have wrote an article in marathi where everybody is taking gm vaccine that is covid shield but they are afraid of eating gm food i think this is a contrast and we must convince therefore that is it has to really change the mind but there are certain cryptic insects salinity drought climate change these are some of the issues which cannot be solved by mere traditional breeding and then we will have to have really the issues for example how did we break the barrier of last barrier of cotton you all know that for 20 years cotton yield was stagnant around 300 kg lid per hectare but in 2002 when we released bt cotton the entire scenario changed you will find why we brought bt cotton because we have failed in controlling bollworm by traditional means and using even pyroxoids cotton became highly susceptible to lepidopteran pest and then the frequent outbreak of so you will find that we were spending more than 504 us dollar billion dollars only on insecticide cotton 44% of insecticide were sprayed on cotton alone and this situation demanded that we do something and traditional breeding we were not a getting success and that's why this gentleman i always pay regards to dr badridara and barwale a man who was just matriculate person i think brought revolution in either seed production in seed industry bahiko was started by him it is more than 50 years now and also he brought the new technology of gm in this country and you will see i am just showing you the graph how all of a sudden you will find the area has and the production has increased up now today the productivity is almost nearly 500 kg lint per hectare constantly for more than now 7 8 years now we are worried that there are talks about why there is a stagnation again but again we need technology that is what my point is there this cotton transformation where we were importing something like uh, 25 lakh bales today we are exporting this year you will be surprised nearly 80 lakh bales are being exported in this country this is something which is unique and therefore we find that these technologies have really helped farmers now 
it is not stopped only with mahiko monsanto but we have jk agri genetics nath seeds metahelix cicr indian institute of science bangalore so many other things people are already doing and biotech is already under various not only uh, insect resistance but herbicide tolerance and several other things are being now tried by but they are all pending issues i always say that they are all pending approval issues for example the socio economic benefits has been analyzed by brooks many times we have also done it many times and it is a very clear distinction that there is an average increase of almost 250 dollars per hectare to nearly 453 dollars per hectare so these benefits and reduction in number of sprays yield increase then more of activities of now your uh, other parasites and parasitoids i think has now changed the entire ecosystem of cotton in this country i think what is important now people have not realized that cotton oil has become one of the important component of vegetable oil because we are now importing vegetable oil worth something like 80000 crores and out of that you will find that 25 million tons of our consumption and we are importing more than 15 million tons of vegetable oil now out of that nearly 4 to 5 million tons is soybean oil then uh, uh, this um, palm oil even we are importing gm mustard oil but we are not allowing our own people we are eating gm cotton oil very interestingly but we are all with and last 18 19 years there has been no damage or anything which has occurred so i think those who are opposing the technology must realize india produced nearly 20.70 million tons of bt cotton seed oil from 2002 to now till now now cotton seed oil is a trans fat free contains no cholesterol and it can play a very significant role in reducing the saturated fat content now i as i said that 1.5 million tons cotton seed oil is produced annually and is being consumed it has become one of the important component of your vegetable oils today so therefore even the cake 5 to 6% cotton seed oil cake which is another very important significant now these are all side effects when you have lint production at the same time you have production of straw which is utilized for briquette making we have seeds we have seed oil we have seed uh, this tinte uh, in spite of the fact that the road to success to bt cotton as you all know is again opposition we started with opposition there was opposition for bt cotton they alleged that bt was a poisonous they scared the public of bt gene they destroyed even experimental plots but still we were not lost there were organized protests against gm as you will find today again this situation is coming the same G, uh, my friend uh, now he will be talking about anand kumar about bt brinjal surprisingly the bt brinjal which is developed by him now the trials were halted this was given to one of the private seed companies by him i think this is something which we have to now think of uh, in spite of the fact that major international organizations have reviewed and opined that gmos are safe hundred nobel prize winners have written that this is the safety issue is not there now there are major biotech crops under development in india i am just talking about the future we have still brinjal going on maize cauliflower rice okra and the trades are now developing we were only hammering initially for insect resistance now we are also trying for virus resistance we are trying also for nutritional resistance nutrition uplift and so many other things which are coming so for example transgenic maize is another potential fall army worm has already entered this country in 2019 and now we are worried about fall army worm which is destroying i would request everybody to kindly keep it on mute aram sir and then transgenic rice there are already see issues and a lot of work has been being done on transgenic rice also so abiotic stress tolerant there is no other alternative but basically in rice even in tomato brinjal tolerance to drought is a important thing i would i was thinking to just show you say for example virus resistant tomato the same dr anand kumar's lab has done wonderful work on all these crops like tomato cotton banana 
finger millet and tobacco so these are some of those crop but what important is that we have series of actual products available in this country rr flex cotton has been already tested for three years what ultimately what has happened last five years there has been an illegal cultivation in idarba to the tune of 15 percent out of 40 lakh hectares 15 percent area is covered by rr flex cotton which is illegal which is not permitted but because the technology is useful the farmers want reduction in labor cost it is being grown now there are also you must have seen reports of bt bridge if government doesn't permit this i think the technology is like water it will flow from any corner and just will come into the uh, system we have a lead blight resistance potato mustard hybrid we have so much of discussion on mustard hybrid developed by deepak pentel and still we are not able to really give golden rice wonderful work i think anand kumar will also explain many things about pod bearer resistant pgnp chickpea why what not we have so many products ready same fruit and shoot borer which is developed by both mahiko then laboratories of varanasi then by iari anand kumar's lab all of them have found way in bangladesh five years of cultivating of bangladesh 30000 farmers are now growing our honorable prime minister was in bangladesh when he said about man ki baat ya man ki baat mein unhone bataya ki bhai we want to have modern technologies adhunikta hame krishi mein lani hai mujhe lagta hai ki what is adhunikta whether allowing gm is not adhunikta same man he has seen what is there in bangladesh and bangladesh is successfully growing it for nearly 7 years now seven five year plan they have already developed it economic benefits are also been worked out farmers are very happy and there are several biotech crops there in bangladesh which are in pipeline so my friends that we develop technologies these are the benefits which are now being uh, assigned you can see uh, at adoption of uh, insecticides in bangladesh is on the area of nearly 3000 hectares 50000 is the total bengal area and out of that 34000 farmers are being is using these technology the small half an acre one acre but this technology has found wide adoption there indian mustard excellent technology of barnet barstar developed by delhi university south campus by our very good friend deepak pentel he struggled for 18 years to develop it and practically now i think it is all halted only because there is no decision making in the entire process nrcpb same i think again anand kumar's lab earlier has event uh, osmotin genes have also been used there so you will find we on the one part as i am just trying to show you that we are importing edible oil and that edible oil is also gm but we are not allowing our farmers to use gm crops what an anomaly what a, what a, what kind of uh, see approach that we have i think this something which is very difficult to be understood now i this is also just to support that you can see import approval of soybean event from 2010 to 2014 soybean imported buyer 18 july i have given date wise this data is all compiled by gac soybean from buyer five census developer purpose of import year of approval of gac they have approved it so the question doesn't arise that what is that another very important crop golden rice i think the man who developed potricus practically wept because he developed it in the public interest and he says that in poverty ridden people this part or this technology will be donated on humanitarian ground and this will definitely change the pro vitamin a carotenoid content of the rice where the people are suffering from blindness from so many other issues with ladies indian rice lines have been developed with 2 to 25 grams of rice produced by breeding and ready for field testing but we are again halt here iron rich high yielding indica rice cultivars what is that denying 
golden rice to malnourished children is a crime against humanity. Probably there was a very good article in Times Magazine from Ingo Poltricus, who is a co-inventor and a very good uh, gentleman, who said that what is this technology developed for? And this is what is the situation. And on the contrary, we have nutritional wounds. Nearly 2,50,000 to 5 lakh people have vitamin A deficiency in children. They go blind every year. Half of them die within a year of losing sight. The tragedy can be eliminated by allowing only to grow golden rice because it contains very high amount of vitamin A content. I think this is what is the technology. Now, for example, we have several biotech crops in pipeline. Many of them are already permitted. There are fusarium built uh, cigatoka disease resistance, less gluten, and all those things, which are now commercially available. Now I come to what is called as the GE technology or what genetic uh, genome editing technology. I think this is the latest. These two ladies, Emanuele Carpentier of Max Planck Unit of Science in Berlin and uh, Jennifer Doudna from University of California, Berkeley. For they got Nobel Prize for development of the method of genome editing, CRISPR-Cas9. I think they, this is what uh, we call it as molecular season. Now, we are all, all of a sudden, we are in a discussion. What is to be done? Our DBT or for that matter, Government of India or GAC is totally confused. There is a dialogue between National Academy Trust of Academic Sciences by Dr. Paroda. We have given recommendations. What kind of regulations you need? There are certain of these products in America, they don't need any regulation. Whether we need those regulations here, we have not even thought over. Last one year, the recommendation from the scientific body has been lying with GEAC and RCGM. What is to be done? How we regulate? Because our scientists are ready. For example, we know that, that there is a tremendous capacity potential of this new breeding technology. We have, for example, the ability to edit native crop genes and coding them imported traits and generating non transient crops. Precision is ad adopted because we can cut at a very specific place. Regulation is science-based. It will fit. It has a speed. It will be a cost-saving and the genome editing crops can be improved. There are already examples in soybean, maize, wheat, rice, potato, tomato, world over. So this technology, like CRISPR-Cas9, talons, and zinker free nucleases, I think what we needed, we uh, need to expose. And our scientific community is competent enough to do that. But they, they don't know whether the product developed through them will see the light of the day. It is 19 years now that the BT cotton, first BT cotton was uh, permitted by government of India, 2002. Now we are in 2021. 19 years we stopped. Only in between what we did is 2000, 2006 was allowed what we call it as BG2. But then we halted. We are not permitting HTBT cotton also. We are not permitted mustard also. We have stopped in 2010 Brinjal also. Are, what is this? We have to take a very positive decision once we uh, are in a, in a scientific world when the science people are already recommending. What is that hinders? It is the scientific decision that is more important than the political decision in such cases. I think in Corona, we always listen to the specialist, what they want to say. Now, if uh, th this uh, is to be done here, and naturally they have to listen to top agriculture scientists, like National Academy of Agriculture Sciences, Indian Academy of Ag uh, Sciences, they are already given writing that such technologies, we need to really promote them. Now, the status of genome editing in India, let me, although I know the product have not been seen in the light of the day, because the regulation itself is not standard. Now, DBT has drafted two separate guidelines. Draft document on genome editor organism, regulatory framework and guidelines, one, and draft guidelines, safety assessment of them. Still, they are thinking that we need what is called as a safety assessment. Maybe we do it, but then let us do it in a 
phased manner as early as possible. We have ICGB has already tried to develop quality traits in rice. They have also tried for HT rice, maize HT, BT, pigeon PHT, biofuels from microbes can be done. IARI, NIPGR, rice quality traits have been already attempted. They are already progressed. NABI, our another institute of DBT at Chandigarh, they have already developed quality traits in case of banana. They are already developing in rice. Icrisat has developed in pearl millet. Delhi University has done it in mustard. And this is what is the situation that we are in the process. Only we want to permit. For example, vitamin A, super banana human trials, which were already, they are already in progress in Mohali. And I had happened to see, actually, I, has, uh, I, I missed a photo, but that already has uh, been done uh, by Dr. Uh, 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 Sharma. And I saw that the product is almost ready. Cotton seed quality improvement, one of our scientists in Texas, uh, A&M, Dr. Kirti Rathod, wonderful technology developed ultra low gossipol cotton seed. Seed specific RNAi silencing. And these gossipol levels have been reduced. So tomorrow, he is very, it's, it's the technology is so wonderful that you need gossipol in foliage. You need gossipol in all other parts. You need them in floral parts also, but because they protect from insects. But you don't need it in the seed. Today, the gossipol is removed chemically and then the olive oil is made edible. But here we have a technology which is permitted by government of uh, in the United States, USDA, to really go in the field, commercialize. And this technology is developed by him. So there are hundreds of things which can be really possible. Only thing is we have to create what is called an environment for more of this, uh, uh, this what they call it as, more kind of uh, research promotion in the, in the field. Now we can't ask scientists that they should do research also, and they can go also to the villages for extension. In spite of that, let us take what is our situation. We are one of the countries where we have more than 82% of the farmers are small farmers, 98 million farmers, like China, like China almost. And we have in many countries in Asia, the small farming is an issue. This is one issue. We are not like yeah. America or Brazil. We have a lot of farmers which are basically, I'll say that holding is so small that it is hardly sometimes two hectares, two and a half hectares. And sometimes it is so small, marginal, one less than one hectare. And this is the dominating factor. 74% of the farmers are marginal farmers. And now they need technologies more, which are more safe, less pesticide consuming. And we also have another issue of what is called as a population bomb. Everybody has said that in spite of the fact that we are now having a better control of population, I think we will be reaching something like 1.70 billion by 2050. And therefore, we will need more food uh, than what is expected. Another very important issue is now there is a diverse food demand and projection. Now, by 2050, our urbanization ratio will change. It will be 55 people in the urban areas and 35 or 31 will be in the rural areas. That is the prediction which is made. That means we will need more of what we call it as non-vegetarian food, egg food, milk, and all other things, fish. The food prices will also rise. There is a rising trend. Food safety issue will come because people will demand more of what we call it as uh, a very precise, uh, safe food. And a uh, lot of, uh, because of better income, they will have a, a better thing. But unfortunate part, I think I have been always trying. India, out of the total GDP of the uh, uh, agriculture, today I am happy that in the pandemic year, our GDP has increased nearly to 20%. I think this is something which is unique. And in this case, we are not spending only 0.4% on the investment in R&D 
in the out of our gdp or agriculture very tragic situation we will had to improve if we have to do like something like 3.4 malaysia take japan china it is more than 1.5 2% america america will leave it but we compare china israel japan korea this is fantastic amount of uh, see investment being done and we are lagging behind in investment so and then we have such pandemics which are coming so naturally there will be lot of so we had to change our policy in such a way that changes in demography with shift towards urbanization and higher income will lead to changes in dietary composition let us say with increased consumption of meat dairy egg having higher water and carbon footprint these are the implications of what is coming so is it not alarming we are just sitting is it not alarming by 2050 will the present practices which we talk about home agriculture we talk about uh, rishi krishi sheti we talk about total organics we talk about something like uh, that uh, uh, zero budget all this is okay but my point is this has a very niche area they cannot be in the totality of the country this present practices therefore or the today's uh, issues of uh, applications of uh, agricultural practices will not be enough to meet the challenges of future as i said safety issues are going to be more important in future also so it is not inevitable to produce more from less and this is what exactly the biotech products are doing we have reduced area and increased productivity and i think in india what we need today is that we cannot spare more land for agriculture and therefore population may grow land may shrink but we will have to produce more from less more less water less land and less inputs this is what is the technologies we need can new technology like what able to meet the challenge they are if we target oriented drought tolerant crops as developed by america in case of cotton and many other crops they have also developed salinity tolerant some of these and which are possible through these by means each agricultural revolution is backed by technology let us remember that if you talk about green revolution hybridization everything in the past milk maybe fish maybe oranges or maybe our orange revolution maybe fruits and vegetables they are all backed by technology in vegetables we started using some of the hybrid models and today there are surplus this is the only year in pandemic where agriculture has made this country's people survive your vegetables were at your door you need not come out of it your fruits are still available so technology milk is available what is not available and that is what is the is the capacity of indian agriculture only thing is we have to recognize that and now the pandemic has really made i hope they uh, the those who are blind towards these technologies now they will open their eyes as our honorable prime minister has rightly said in man ki baat ki ab hame krishi mein adhunikta lane ki zarurat hai i am very happy when he made this statement hope he means adhunikta means gm crops also thus the country needs adoption and infusion of biotech crops gm technologies including the newer ones of what we call it as gene editing i come to the end i think i am already in time almost 35 minutes today's world is divided not by ideology but by technology let us remember this is the words of uh, Uh, this uh, jeffrey sachs is an economist uh, i read this and i was really impressed this demands bold new thinking and development you will have to think differently if our honorable prime minister always say think differently then only we will be able to really survive a small part of the globe accounting for some 50% of earth's population provides nearly the entire world's technology innovation remember they are all where are our nobel prize winners coming from let us imagine how they are and how what contributions they have made 
the second part involving perhaps half of the world population is able to adopt these technologies in production and consumption the remaining part covering around a third of the world population is technologically disconnected neither innovating at home nor adopting foreign technologies i was a member of the african biosafety network expertise for nearly 6 years and almost visited almost all african countries there are now they have woken up and i was surprised that the way they are now adopting gm technologies i think it will surpass india also in this 6 years i found that there is a growth going on not only bt cotton but it is against triga it is against uh, see nutritional issues drought several uh, areas there is research going on in uganda kenya nigeria ghana i am really impressed i think this is what is probably is the innovation and the foreign technologies will emerge early there so we have oceans of now data knowledge is a king and when we expect now the fourth industrial revolution it will all start with information communication technology today you are already seeing that instead of i coming to pune i am able to contact so many people with this new technology i think so therefore data does not equal information information does not equal knowledge and most importantly knowledge does not equal wisdom so we have to convert small puddles of knowledge into what we call it as drops of ocean i think this is my last slide and i would like to really thank on behalf of my organization sbc that uh, uh, the gnana prabodhini has organized one of the wonderful program for emerging technologies 12 months 12 tech seminar i think this is something which is unique and uh, the members who are i only request dravid that now it is time we are already getting old we are not directly in the labs now but i want that the students of nan prabodhini to have access to such kind of lectures let them be exposed what is going on in the world i think with these few words once again i would like to thank professor david uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity thank you very much thank you sir thank you yeah uh, what we can do is i think we will uh, go ahead with the presentation of dr anand kumar and then take yeah, the yeah. questions okay yeah. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, uh, I would like to thank Nana Prabodhini, Dr. Dravit, respected uh, Dr. Mai, and uh, all the alumni of Nana Prabodhini. So, I would like to speak on uh, genetically modified and genetically and genome edited crops. Uh, at the same time avoiding some repetitive stuff as you all know in the early 1980s three institutions have pioneered genetic engineering or genetic manipulation promising many many things like more food better quality food safer food healthy foods and designer foods and this technology indeed has kept its promise so as you see the global status as of now the area of gm crops in 2019 was 190 million hectares in 29 countries 43 countries imported foods and products derived from gm crops and the major traits of these gm crops were insect pest resistance herbicide tolerance virus resistance male sterility modified oil quality and about uh, 15 other minor traits and as this slide shows you 
the non food crops are cotton poplar ranging up to floricultural crops of rose and petunia but the most important thing one has to notice here is the major food crops the field crops ranging from maize up to cowpea have been cultivated globally as you can see in very very important crops like uh, uh, wheat rice cowpea also have been uh, cultivated so much so the benefits of cultivating economic uh, gm crops have been well documented for more than a decade or so by brooks and barfoot uh, as mentioned by dr mai the increased crop production and value was by the range of 224 billion us dollars and the most important thing is cultivating gm crops resulted in a better environment by saving 776 million kilograms of pesticides used on the farms not only that it reduced carbon dioxide emissions for instance in one year 27 billion kilograms of co2 equivalent to removing 16 million cars off the roads the gm crops conserved biodiversity by saving 231 million hectares of land and economically they helped alleviate poverty by helping 17 million small farmers who are some of the poorest of the poor people in the world and as you all know the revolution started in 1983 1984 with the release of slow ripening tomato but the real impact of the revolution was seen right from 1995 when bt cotton bt maize and herbicide tolerant soybean were cultivated or approved for cultivation in usa bt cotton which has been approved and started cultivated in 1995 as dr mai has mentioned it carries a gene encoding for a delta endotoxin of bt a soil bacterium which is used as a biopesticide since 1930s in human society and the gene confers resistance to four different bollworms and caterpillars it protects the yield mind you it does not enhance the yield it only protects the yield and another most important thing is it resulted in drastic reduction of pesticide consumption to a degree of 300000 metric tons of pesticide ingredient so enormous economic social and environmental benefits have been enjoyed by human kind since then and in india as dr mai has already mentioned the first gm crop that is bt cotton has been approved in the year 2002 and today we are the first in global cotton production with 42 million bales in 2019 20 not only that the textile industry the cotton industry and all accessory industries have become have got a thrust and have become very 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 viable and also very very profitable and productive and meanwhile what happened bt as well as uh, herbicide tolerant cotton in a single combined event namely roundup ready flex bt cotton was sought to be introduced by buyer which is uh, of course uh, the new name for monsanto have uh, 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 entered rr flex bt cotton for testing in 2013 and the trials in fact have taken place but unfortunately the company has withdrew the application in view of the regulatory and ipr related uncertainty in the year 2016 but at the same time after 2015 this event has pilfered 
into the illegal cultivation in several states. And uh, in the year 2009, the pink ballworm, which was earlier a minor pest in cotton, the two is sparsely occurring pest in cotton has become a major menace in Bt cotton because it has developed resistance to both Craven AC and Cray 2 AB insecticidal proteins present in Bolgar 2. But there is no reason for despair. Short duration, single pick Bt cotton, deployment of refugia, use of pheromone traps, surveillance-based sprays, crop rotation and sanitation would really help Bt cotton preventing pink bollworm infestation. And the South Asia Biotechnology Center and Dr. Mai and Dr. Choudhury have been uh, doing human service in propagating this uh, philosophy among the cotton farmers, Bt cotton farmers with great success. And another most important uh, trait is herbicide resistance, as I have mentioned earlier. And most of the herbicide resistant crops we see in the field are resistant to eco-friendly herbicides like Roundup or glyphosate. So much so, we have globally five different herbicide resistant crops. And it is also the predominant trait in global GM crops. The side benefits of cultivating herbicide resistance crops are conservation tillage and better weed control, a dream of all soil scientists and agronomists. In fact, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, the Roundup Ready Flex Bt cotton has encountered serious impediments and it got em em uh, engrossed in this uh, regulatory imbroglio. And unfortunately, it, it got stuck in the regulatory logjam. What India needs beyond Bt cotton, as you all know, and also as uh, Dr. Mai has mentioned, we, we need pest resistant pulses and vegetables going down up to nutrient use efficiency in our major cereals like rice and wheat. So towards this objective, the pest resistant vegetables were some of the first transgenic uh, or GM crops that have been developed by various institutions in public and private sector. Mahiko has again taken a pioneering role and they have developed BT benzol expressing Craven AC for protection against to shoot and fruit borer. And after uh, a, a span of nine years, the event EE1, which has been proven very, very effective and also biosafe, was recommended by Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee in the year 2009. But unfortunately, the then Minister of Environment and Forest imposed 10-year moratorium in the year 2010. It's now more than 10 years, but there is no signal, there is no way that this moratorium would be lifted by the government of India. Not only that, the EE1 was given to public research institutions like IIVR, Varanasi, University of Agricultural Sciences, Dharwad, and Tamil Nadu Agricultural University by Mahiko, basically for deployment in varieties. And uh, you can see the spectacular protection uh, conferred by BT in one variety, for example, BT KKM1 from Tamil Nadu Agriculture University. But unfortunately, because of strident anti-GM propaganda, many attempts were made to involve the technology develop developers as well as scientists in legal litigation. Meanwhile, what happened? Mahiko has given to Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute the EE1 event for deployment in varieties, an effort mediated by Agricultural Biotechnology Support Program of Cornell University. And the Bangladesh government has approved four varieties of Bt Brinzal in the year 2014 for cultivation. And uh, uh, unfortunately, as unconfirmed reports say, 
that uh, this EE1 has uh, seeped into India and illegal cultivation of Bt Brinzal is rampant in many states. But uh, there is still no certainty whether it is uh, EE1 event that has gone to Bangladesh from India or an indigenously developed Bt Brinzal event. The GEAC and the Department of Biotechnology are grappling with this problem, but uh, no information is forthcoming. Simultaneously, a Beej Shetal company based in Jalna in collaboration with the NRC for Plant Biotechnology under public-private partnership has deployed Bt Cry1 FA1 gene, a synthetic patented gene of NRCPB in two hybrids of Beech Shetal. The BRL1 is completed. As you can see here, BRL1 at three locations has given spectacular protection against Brinzal shoot and fruit borer. As you can see, Janak BT and BSS 79 BT, the mean percent damage was 0.82 and 1.39. In contrast to counterpart non-BT Janak and non-BT BSS 793 affected by about 24 and 26%. Unfortunately, uh -huh. TRL2 is also stuck in regulatory log, log jam. The government of India, Ministry of Environment and Forests, has given approval in the month of September 2020 for BRL2 in five to six states and asked the company to submit no objection certificates. But later what happened was the government of India a month back has uh, uh, given a statement that all field trials of all transgenic GM crops, including Bt Brinzal, have been put on hold. And as Dr. Mai has mentioned, there is another very, very important uh, uh, event in Indian mustard, that is uh, Brassica gensia, developed by Professor Deepak Pantel of Delhi University for hybrid production. High yielding hybrids which have been developed based on this technology about uh, 18 years back by University of California, San Diego. And uh, uh, the native version has been developed under uh, uh, DBT support by UDSC. And all the testing, including uh, biosafety, environmental safety, BRL1, BRL2, everything has been successfully and satisfactorily completed and the, fol uh, uh, and the folder is with the genetic engineering appraisal committee which is sitting on this file for a long time more than two to three years nobody knows whether they have shelved it abandoned it or decided not to communicate to the developer the fate of this technology that is that is the unfortunate state of our uh, GG crop development. Another very, very important trait that has been sought to be commercialized, approved, uh, tested by Mahiko is nitrogen use efficient transgenic rice using a single gene alanine amino transferase. As you can see the histogram, rice uh, that is genetically modified rice grown at very, very minimal levels of nitrogen gives better yield than counterpart non-transgenic or non-GM rice. As you can see, the cartoon, the picture, ni ni uh, nitrogen use efficient rice on left side and the control rice on the right side, both grown at very, very minimal levels of nitrogen. BRL1 testing is completed, but unfortunately, the company and the government and the uh, uncooperative regulatory policies force the regulators, uh, the developers to shelve this because of the uncertainties mentioned earlier. Similarly, at NRC Plant Biotechnology, pot borer resistant PGNP has been developed. As you all know, how important uh, uh, pot borer protection in legumes like chickpea and PGNP. This has been tested in glass house and net house several times under DBT guidelines, but 
the event selection trial application is now sleeping in the Department of Biotechnology for the last three to four years, and the fate is uncertain. So if you see two slides, which I am going to show now in this and the next, the list of various crops, more than a dozen crops here, and more than 10 different traits with the institutions in public research sector, like uh, ICAR institutes, CSIR institutes, conventional universities, agricultural universities have all been now put on the shelf after 2012 or after 2013. Similarly is the case with the private research, the commercial uh, companies, multinational companies, as well as uh, native seed companies that have been doing trials of various GM crops, as you can see, ranging from brinzal, cauliflower, okra, rice, tomato, up to cotton. About uh, half a dozen traits, as you can see, predominantly it is insect resistance followed by herbicide tolerance. And all this has been stuck. And I tell you a very, very sad incident. One of the leading multinational, transnational companies that has been involved in GM research, which has put millions and millions of dollars for development of important GM crops in India, has brought each and every seed out of their vaults and in front of the members of Institute Biosafety Committee and a representative of DBT have put the whole seed on bonfire and wrote a letter to the Department of Biotechnology and the Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee that they would never ever enter into transgenic GM research in India. That is the sorry state of affairs. As Dr. Mai has mentioned, an individual like Ingo Potricus weeps, but many individuals who have spent 20, 25 years, 30 years in public as well as private institutions, single-mindedly pursued development of GM crops, GM events at many, many places. They weep silently, they are dejected, frustrated, and their lifetime achievements, lifetime work has been brought to nil, totally nil, by the same government that has funded GM crop research and development in universities and institutions right from 1990s. Hundreds and thousands of crores of money have been spent by the government of India. And everything has come to nil. Everything has come to naught. What are the major impediments for such a uh, such a uh, imbroglio is the government and the government agencies dis disrespecting its own committee's science-based decisions. Who are these committees formed by the arms of the government of India? Departments of the government of India. And once a decision has been made, whether it is in RCGM or GEAC, the government has to respect the decision of the experts. These are science-based decisions. And why they disrespect these decisions? Because they are influenced by the strident and unscientific, illogical anti-GM propaganda of few individuals or few NGOs. And at the same time, unfortunately, the scientific community voiced their concerns in protest very, very feebly or very, very silently. Most of the scientific community is silent. And Minister of Environment and Forest in 2010 has put a new regulation that each and every developer, technology developer, has to obtain a no objection certificate from the respective state governments on the plea or on the excuse 
that agriculture is a state subject. Okay, fine. But then, one after another, one after another, most of the state governments under pressure, strident propaganda, as mentioned earlier, they stopped issuing no objection certificate. And one year back, there was some light at the end of the tunnel with one government order saying that if you do not get a reply from the state government in a month or so, you can go ahead with the trials. So there was some hope an year, an year back. But now, on March 22, 22nd, 2021, the Minister of Environment and Forests made a statement in Lok Sabha, as I mentioned earlier, that the government of India halted all the field trials, including that of BT Brinza. So what is the future? The future is totally pessimistic, bleak, because the previous government controlled or ruled by NDA was the root cause of the problem. And the current, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the UPA earlier, and the current NDA government also doesn't seem to give any kind of consideration or attention to this important problem or important issue or important technology. So, although I am, I am an inveterate uh, optimist, I am forced, I am constrained to say, to put this last bullet, that is, is it pessimistic future? for GM crops, but the world is not stopping. The world, in fact, rest of the world is leaving us behind. As Dr. Mai has mentioned, countries like Nigeria, Kenya, and other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have approved new novel GM crops like pot borer resistant BT Kopi in 2019. So that comes up, with that we come to genome editing. Dr. Mai has explained uh, the basic philosophy behind genome editing. In fact, uh, the kind of euphoria we had in 1980s and 1990s that uh, GM crops would bring about a spectacular revolution in agriculture. And as I mentioned, the GM crops have really kept that promise and the revolution was real. And as, uh, as Dr. Mai mentioned, the pioneering research of the Nobel laureate Charpentier and Doudna with respect to genome editing, in fact, promised much more spectacular, much more mind-boggling developments in agriculture as well as other spheres of human life. Because genome editing gives us an opportunity to make uh, simple changes, even complex changes, in in situ genes, native genes of an organism, rather than bringing a gene from outside exogenously as in genetically modified crops. So there are three different genome editing technologies, zinc finger nucleases, talons, and CRISPRs. Out of these three, the most simple and most widely adopted technology is CRISPR-Cas9, which is nothing but a simple bacterial immune system to ward off viruses. So the, the bacteria have developed a very, very ingenious way of uh, warding off viruses by CRISPR technology. I do not go into the details of this, but as you can see here, in the past, uh, one decade or less than one decade, if you see few examples of genome editing in some major field crops like rice, maize, soybean, it's a mind boggling, mind boggling list ranging from disease resistance, abiotic stress tolerance, and uh, nutrient deficiencies, and uh, scavenging. Uh, scavenging heavy metals and uh, better yield under stress conditions and so on and so forth. Nutritional quality, for example, you can remove phytic acid or you can enhance iron content in wheat and uh, uh, 
Dr. Mayer also has shown uh, the banana that is enriched in iron that has been developed in uh, uh, Australia. And in horticultural crops, because they are simple to handle, the list of the genome edited events in horticultural crops is much more, much, much more profound and mind boggling. As you can see here, crops like tomato, carrot, potato, sweet potato, citrus, apple, and so on, you have bacterial resistance, virus resistance, you can generate haploids, you can generate parthenocarpy, long shelf life, slow ripening, herbicide tolerance, overcoming incompatibility, citrus canker resistance, and whatnot. In fact, uh, the progress in genetically edited, uh, genome edited crop technology is absolutely, absolutely mind boggling. Every day, every week, every month, you see something spectacular, something, uh, something really sweeps you off your feet. That kind of uh, uh, progress is being made. And uh, as, uh, as it has been mentioned earlier, the technology is very, very precise, very, very simple, much more simpler than inducing mutations by chemicals or uh, radiation or whatever, but you know where you are working upon, which base you are going to change, which basis you are going to manipulate. And just a few weeks back, I think it is just three or four weeks back, Japan has taken a big stride. They said, we are not going to regulate the genome edited crops. For example, here it is tomato, developed by Sanatec seed. It contains high levels of GABA, and amino acids that helps us helps us to relax and also lower blood pressure. It contains four to five times more GABA than regular tomato. The government of Japan said, we are not going to regulate it. You please go ahead. That is the kind of bold science-based decisions we need from governments. And uh, as Dr. Mai has mentioned, the uh, Department of Biotechnology and the Ministry of Science and Technology has developed a draft to regulate genetic, uh, genome editing plants and of course other organisms too. But as we, uh, as we are concerned here only with plants, there are three different groups mentioned by the Department of Biotechnology. The group one is the plants with genome with only one or a few base pair edits or deletions. Mercifully, the regulation in this case is minimal. That is, only the Institute Biosafety Committee can oversee this and approve this genome edited plant for cultivation. Of course, with information to the Department of Biotechnology. Okay, that is fine. But when you come to the group two, they have uh, put a spanner in the wheel. Genome with a few or several base pair edits. The plant should undergo trait efficacy trials and will be assessed for substantial equivalence with similar varieties, except for the targeted changes. This is where uh, uh, the real problem arises. When you are dealing with existing bases, few or several, and you are changing those bases without disturbing the protein, but only altering the expression. And you are doing that very, very precisely. And you can also know whether there is any fallout, any off, off effects, very precisely and very, very uh, significantly. So this particular group should have been clubbed with the group one. But unfortunately, the Department of Biotechnology, in all their wisdom, has chosen to keep this under IBSC, RCGM, and GESC. That is almost similar to a GM crop regulation. And the group three, with which I have no 
complaint or I have no issue is genome with large DNA changes, including insertions of foreign DNA. Yes, take it for granted. We all agree. Every scientist working with GM crops or genome edited crops would agree that this has to undergo stringent regulatory system. So the risk assessment will be the same as for GM that carry foreign genes. So IBSC, RCGM, GESC would certainly regulate it and there is no issue. This is what we have written to the Department of Biotechnology when the draft was circulated. This is what uh, the wise scientists in the Agricultural Academy have also informed the DBT. But one year henceforth, the fate of this draft is unknown. Since January 2020, it is deafening silence. You talk to anyone in DBT, you talk to anyone in GESC, everybody simply gives a mystifying smile. A mystifying smile. And probably you have to make your own conclusions about the fate of genome editing. And I am constrained to say, unfortunately, genome editing of crops in India is going to meet the same fate of genetically engineered or genetically modified crops. That, that, is, that is a very, very pessimistic statement, but unfortunately, that is so. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so, there are a lot of questions in the chat box, which... Uh... Hello? Yes, Dravid. Uh, yeah. So, one of the major concerns is about health concerns and fears. It could be rational or irrational, but uh, the question coming up repeatedly is uh, uh, how are the health concerns, particularly on human beings, genetically edited crops? See, at least for GM, there is no concerns at all. Because I think the person who is asking must have taken some vegetable oil, must have been eating vegetable oil for a long time. We are eating it for more than, I think, 18 years now. And most of the oil imported is already GM. If it is mixed in groundnut or maybe mixed in mustard, but we are already. So safety issues internationally has been accepted. So there should not be any problem. And it is not only for Indians. It is, the issues are not for Indians. They have been well studied everywhere, particularly for BT cotton when we released. It has been studied in almost all animals, small organisms, bigger organisms, health, human health. So I think this is a fear, irrational fear. <clears throat> Any other questions? There was another question about whether it is some kind of a colonization of Indian agriculture. But I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can, because Dr. Anand Kumar has worked with a lot of Indian, this thing, public system as well as Indian private sector companies also. So, there is colonization. He has already shown you two slides <laughs> where there are two uh, equal two dozen private industries and more than two dozen of public sector industries. Yeah, yeah. They're already working. Correct. Absolutely Correct. no. If you recollect those two slides, yeah. where the list of GM events under public sector and the commercial private sector have been displayed, there is absolutely no cause for worry or concern. In fact, they are equally well balanced. The, uh, 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 the events that have been actually awaiting release approval have been developed in public, public, sector. public sector institutions and right, of course right. and also multinational corporations, but also public sector uh, institutions. Dr. Mai has mentioned 
about the blight resistant potato developed by uh, yeah. University of Wisconsin Madison, but it has been given to Central Potato Research Institute. Then golden rice developed by Syngenta given to uh, EV and India and Bangladesh. These are all developed under uh, partnerships. And uh, I, I, I would like to mention the Bangladesh is going to commercialize. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I should not use the word commercialize. Bangladesh is going to approve cultivation of golden rice Very anytime. True, yeah. Anytime. And we'll be just left gaping at them, which is a very, very unfortunate thing. Nobody can colonize Indian agriculture. Let me tell you very frankly, because such a diversified agriculture nowhere is on the earth. So you, nobody, even if any private company is coming from outside or multinational, will never be able to do that because we have very small holders. Um, in cotton alone, there are more than 8 million farmers. How can they colonize? Impossible. Well, there is another question about can consumption of GM crops cause antibiotic resistance? This is again a fear which uh, I think has been answered many times. This was all the NGOs used to say antibiotic resistance and all that. Nothing has happened. At least with BT cotton experience for a long time, we are already safe. No question. Okay. Any other? So, any other questions are there from audience? Yes, Professor yeah. Prashant. Yes, yeah, sir. I, yeah. yeah, I have a question about. See, we have been approaching the problem from the viewpoint of modifying the properties of the uh, crop and uh, generating resistance to pest, uh, chemicals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How about creating genetically engineered counter pests, uh, which will be uh, engineered to defend the crops against pests? So we could have genetically engineered insects being bred, and then uh, uh, they could uh, be bred in a swarm and attack the uh, pests, which are uh, likely to destroy the crops. So we, we like cultivate an army to uh, uh, defend the uh, crop. Sir Prashant, that is uh, one good approach, but unfortunately, that takes more than uh, what expenses than developing a crop because we have done it where there is a pest of human beings like uh, uh, mosquito. We have now developed mosquitoes which are not able to really transmit anything and uh, which will not cause any damage. But that is possible, then it is causing more problem in human beings. But if you want to talk about crop pests are number. Each crop has more than 10, 15 important pests. So instead of that, if we can have a general resistance available, and that is more easier in plants to do it because you can control plant uh, population, while here it is not uh, releasing of insects anywhere in the field. Okay. So and uh, the reason why uh, GM okay. crops so are my... really suspicion yeah. could be because uh, see, when you are trying to uh, engineer certain properties into it, uh, develop certain resistance, it is possible that you miss out on certain uh, nutrients or some, some kinds of uh, food quality in, uh, into it. And, and therefore, uh, people suspect that uh, the uh, uh, GM crops would be nutritionally inferior in nothing, some way as else. compared see, to the... I think uh, Dr. Anand Kumar will tell you it's very uh, systematic research which has been done where we are trying to see that whatever uh, crops which are developed, whether nutritionally they have the same equivalence or not, for all purposes, except for the trait which we are talking about. Am I right, Anand Kumar? Hmm. Yes, sir. In yeah. fact, uh, uh, Professor Prash uh, Prashant Ji, both these technologies, that is uh, genetic, uh, genetic manipulation as well as genome editing are so precise, you know what you are really doing. And you know what the ultimate product is. And you can dissect out the genetically modified or genome edited plant to know exactly what are the, uh, what are the inadvertent unintended effects. And we have seen this in the past 30 years 
of GM crops development when you express a foreign gene in a genetically modified plant or very recently when you edit a particular gene in genetic uh, in genome edited plant you exactly know what you are doing and absolutely no adverse effect with either for the physiology biochemistry and metabolism of the plant or yeah, same. the physiology and biochemistry of the consumer the uh, human health okay. there is absolutely if, no concern if, even the entire metabolic process they have been studied and very interestingly okay. probably uh, the genetic engineering which is being tried in human being for some of the intractable diseases like cancer because if you know that a certain pair of genes can be removed which are causing cancer i think it will be one of the finest treatments that we will have my, in human being dr dr my yeah please go ahead i i am dr i am dr gadwal ha ah, gadwal ji how are you <laughs> after a long time i am hearing your voice <laughs> both doctors dr gadwal yeah you both have doctors. any question dr gadwal i think he's very pretty old man okay 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 so i think there is a hand hand raised by anjali yes uh, thank you so much uh, uh, so i would like to thank both the scientists for their wonderful uh, presentation i have one question that uh, how far safe it is if we transfer genes from prokaryotes to eukaryotes like from bacteria to plants uh, will it be affecting the safety of the uh, plants in any adverse way you uh, you know bt cotton yes anjali bt cotton yes, is the same you have carried a gene from bacillus thuringiensis has it caused any damage uh, oh. no i i was more concerned about the edible plants because cotton is not edible but edible plants we have soya bean edible plants you have uh, bt brinjal mm -hmm. nothing has happened so bangladesh is growing it for 7 years okay now we have bt cowpea as you said in okay. nigeria so mm -hmm. there is absolutely no problem when you carry a prokaryotic gene like from bacillus now we are also trying to see that those biotic agents like uh, trichoderma has a huge amount of genes for resistance because trichoderma is otherwise used as a biocontrol agent for a number of diseases can yes. the israelis are already trying that some of those genes can be really introduced into the plant so that you can create a resistant plant my point is that here it is no random uh, mating as you do it in traditional breeding you have a very specific thing that i have a space where i will put that gene that is what is been done in cotton in brinjal in soybean maize so many bt crops okay sir hey uh, may i add uh, something yeah to, please uh, anjali ji yeah in fact uh, most of the commercially cultivated gm crops they hmm. carry prokaryotic genes one okay, spectacular yeah. example has already been mentioned by dr mai that is bt a mm -hmm. soil bacterium but you know all other major gm crops in the uh, in the world whether uh, it is herbicide tolerance whether it is a uh, hybrid production uh, whether it is slow ripening or golden rice which is under production they all have prokaryotic genes mostly from bacteria okay yeah future yeah. also bacteria in future also bacteria are going to provide us large number of genes yeah which are very useful that's why now microbiology research is very becoming more important okay thank you i think thank person dravid we are already 6:30 yes 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 okay uh, so so there is one question i am dr monica jamla please go yeah uh, i am i am currently working as assistant professor at modern college ganesh khin pune ha uh. uh, uh, associated with dr vinay kumar malik in biotech department 
so uh, it is a nice uh, i mean uh, presentation from all of the seniors in their field i want to know that in amongst in india if i want to get a training a hands on training in crispr technology which could be the best place in current scenario uh, you go I to chandigarh to... there is a institute of nabi nabi okay. institute in chandigarh which is under okay, dbt sir. you go okay, there sir. and you will get good training there okay 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 thank you so much sir Okay, we'll take one last question from Jidnyasa. Jidnyasa, sure. Can you, Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Bolekar. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful presentation. Thank you both. Um, I didn't know so much research was going on in our own universities. Uh, I have two questions. When we test for these GMOs or CRISPR edited, like gene edited uh, crops. Uh, do we also look at the ecological evaluations are there any ecological testing done where because we are only looking at safety of humans but are we also looking at safety of other animals like cows may be eating it or so it might be you know going into a river like and the other thing is about seed, seed sovereignty so when um, the uh, work or research is Yeah, I, I, public we, universities. We understood, we understood your question. Yeah. yeah. In BT cotton, there is a protocol that you have to test ecology also. You have, you, mm -hmm. if you see the final report of any GM crop submitted to the R, uh, GAC, it has all those components, even all so, those even predators, parasites, microbes, soil organisms, large animals, small animals, everything. So, so how many you know, generations do we test for? Right? Uh, you only thing we have not tested against tiger and lions. Let me tell you very frankly, because otherwise we will say that there will be effect on lion. How long do you do it in medicine? How long you do it for vaccine this time? In two years we have brought vaccine. Okay, it is tested, madam. There yes. are protocols where the number of years are already fixed, and accordingly we go ahead. E If it is telling that I want to test uh, effect on human beings for ten years, it is better that the technology should not be brought, because ten years you will say the science has already gone ahead, much ahead. So we have to have a limit for that. Please ensure I am telling you that there is absolutely no effect, ecological either on any animals or anything. Even in BT cotton, there was a report that these ships eat it, and it has been proved beyond doubt. that nothing has happened to that after that report okay right because like i think of green revolution and when uh, the pesticides were introduced it was all like nobody thought that they would cause such a harm and now we know all the bad effects of pesticides 10 years see is a very small time on a ecological time scale but we madam, might yeah every technology has its own toll pesticides yeah. are bad because you have not used them properly gm crops will also be bad if your use is not proper the whole right. system so, the technology has to go along with proper what we call it as management yes, and yes. wherever there has been a good management it has worked very well and that is what is how happened for 19 years we have worked with cotton nothing has happened and we have right. taught people For example, in Ting Bolwar, when there was a problem coming, as Dr. Anand Kumar has said, we have immediately started a campaign that what is wrong that we have done in the practice? We have stopped refugia. So there are issues when you come out with any type. Suppose you are taking vaccine. Now vaccine, they say you have to wait for uh, 28 days. You have to wait for 45 days. Then you will get more antibodies formed. See, there are always regulations. Along with the technology which is going on, but today you are saying that we will take the vaccine, to lenge, but we will not eat GM crop. This is something which is not acceptable. Yes, okay. I have more faith in gene editing than transgenics. That's my point of view. No, no, but faith okay. could be yeah, personal. Yeah, it is. But I don't know if there is a long-term data enough to support. Yeah, I am still skeptical. Uh, now kindly define what is long term that is most important at least long term means 100 years? years yeah so you uh, yeah. you, you said it years. very correctly i don't uh, think anybody needs 300 years for any yeah 
and basically you know i think let us leave that choice to the consumers because uh, i we think have already if, you, live, you, if you yeah if you don't want you ago, don't need any technology which were developed 300 years ago are no more with us now <laughs> if that's the that's very telling isn't it <laughs> good i think uh, uh, yes ajit uh, ajit chaugule yes sir yeah uh, quick, uh, quick good doctors uh, thank you very much i am from uh, sugarcane agriculture and sugar industry so what is the status and uh, fate of uh, this gm for sugarcane crop because it is a uh, 1 million hectares in maharashtra and 5 million hectares uh, at national level and it brings about 1 lakh crore economy to the nation and uh, oh, already we have exported ajit. about 6 million ton sugar so how ajit, about sugarcane crop sir ajit i Thank forgot you. to mention about sugarcane sugar cane the most important challenge is water we are consuming this is a water a guzzling crop rice and sugar cane so what we need is to water saving crop and fortunately indonesia has already developed a drought tolerant uh, indonesia uh, sugar cane where mr sharad pawar has sent a team with my efforts we have sent a team to indonesia what kind of this is japanese genes which they are using it so we have a technology now available only thing is how do we promote it the thanks thanks so i think we had a very interesting discussion for last one and a half hours and i must thank dr mai and dr anand kumar for giving a excellent uh, overview of what are the developments which have happened in india and across the world also and the reasons why things are not really progressing well in india i just hope that the things should start to change because now that uh, there are a lot of challenges faced by agriculture uh, primarily we want to double the farmers income and uh, benefit the farmers also and other challenges like climate change nutrition security all these things are coming up and i think in these areas both gm as well as ge crops will play a very crucial role and uh, that is why let us hope let us not be a pessimistic because i know that dr anand kumar has become pessimistic because he has fought with the whole system for all of his life being a part of public sector scientist but still he had to fight it out with the different departments but let us hope that the change will happen and if not anything i think the farmers are also driving the change as you rightly pointed out when illegal cultivation starts i think somewhere the government has to take cognizance of all these things and come out with practical approach for introducing these crops and helping the farmers to improve their income levels so uh, with this i would conclude this uh, seminar it was very interesting and i think we would like to keep few more things because this was more on a scientific uh, side that we had even though we touched about some of the regulatory issues and all that but i think there are a lot of socio economic angles also to this problem which needs to have a broader discussion amongst our group and i i would once again like to thank uh, dr anand kumar and uh, dr mai for uh, uh, putting uh, giving their time for this uh, session and also i would like to uh, thank all the participants because uh, i'm seeing more than 80 people had joined this webinar and uh, they were really engaged in this whole thing as we could see from the comments and all that if there is anything uh, you would like to enquire about all these things you can put it to uh, our group so that i can take up uh, your questions to uh, professor anand kumar and dr mai and come back with the answers because i know that in this one and half hours we would not have uh, perhaps answered all the things which uh, you have raised so uh, please feel free to write to us so that we can Uh, take it up uh, with both these scientists and come back to you with answers for your uh, queries thank you very much thank you. and thank, thank you, you our group also for 
supporting particularly our spg group uh, who, which has supported in organizing this uh, whole event uh, in very effective way thanks a lot thank, thank you. you thank you can you please uh, share